टुडे ऑन ट्वेंटी एट्थ ऑफ जुलाई आई एम डॉक्टर शैलेश शर्मा एंड आई वेलकम डॉक्टर कार्तिक पौंडीचेरी एज अवर स्पीकर फॉर टूडे टॉक टू एक्सपर्ट प्रोग्राम बिफोर आई बिगिन आई वुड लाइक टू ब्रीफ अबाउट आई स्टेम Indian Science Technology and Engineering Facilities Map (ISTEM) it is a national program of government of India for shaping the R&D infrastructure and supports academia and industry to achieve the goal of Nirbhar Bharat. It holds the database of functioning R&D equipment and facilities from government or private funding, with options to researchers to check the availability and operational status of geographically dispersed facilities, and reserve the most suitable one online and pay per use through the portal. Digital catalog on ISTEM portal is available with 700 technology and technology products, as mandated by Empowered Technology Group, to help academia and industry to decide the thrust areas and use the available indigenous technologies products to manufacture the required infrastructure for the society. ISTEM is striving to create the pool of skilled manpower and the job opportunities for them in scientific establishment. Ah. <coughs> uh, Today we have with us Dr. Karthik Pondicherry. He is technical manager at Anton Par India Private Limited. Dr. Karthik has completed his doctorate in tribology from University of Leoben, Austria. He has over a decade of experience in the field of tribology. He has managed the global tribology tribology portfolio at Anton Par in Graz, Austria, until the end of 2019. He later moved to India and started as technical manager for rheology at Anton Par India. Over the past years, Dr. Pondicherry has conducted numerous seminars and trainings for people from both academia and industry across the globe. Across the globe. Now I am handing over to Dr. Karthik Pondicherry. Dr. Karthik Pondicherry, uh, over to you. So I hope you can hear me, Dr. Shailesh. Thanks yeah. for. the invite and thanks for organizing this it's a real good platform for not just students but people from different uh, scopes in academia to get an idea what other subjects or fields of interest exist and also like you know it's a nice platform to interact with people as well so i'm really glad that uh, this initiative has been taken and uh, also on behalf of anton par would like to thank you personally for you. for giving us this opportunity so So let me share my screen right away, and then we can start off with uh, the topic of the day. And just a second. Uh, you are able to see the screen now. Yeah, it is okay, coming. Great. So okay. perfect. Thanks. So. we are going to talk about applied biology today and this is a field which is very dear to me of course tribology is my first love but again rheology is something that i've been working on relentlessly for a few years now and anton par we we are manufacturers of rheometer i'm not going into details about that because that's the commercial aspect of uh, things which i don't want to talk about right now so here to begin with when i say like okay rheology what exactly is rheology so when you look at it rheology is the deformation and flow behavior of materials and this is not just restricted to the flow behavior of fluids but if you look at it then you have materials which are both viscous and which are more elastic as well so elastic materials for instance if you are looking at the eiffel tower on the right and then you can see that okay it's uh it's not going to flow right you can deform it but you can't make it flow until unless you heat it up to such uh, extreme temperature if it's made of steel perhaps to 1400 to 1539 degrees then you'll melt it and then you make it flow but then again its state changes so in terms of materials which are not going to flow per se but are going to get deformed they still can be investigated or characterized with the help of rheology so that's one part of it the next part of it is that you have n number of materials which are viscous elastic in nature what does that mean that means that they have both viscous behavior or they exhibit both viscous behavior and elastic behavior so if you're early in the morning you wake up and the first thing you're going to use is a toothpaste that comes under the category of viscous elastic because it has a viscous behavior it flows but then you also uh experience 
that when you push it out of the tube and then you you know release the force, some of the material goes back into the tube because it's elastically deformed. It's not flowing away like water does. So that is something that you can investigate as well. Hand creams, shampoos, paste, ketchup, mayonnaise. So all these things come under viscoelastic materials. And then of course you can go into deeper things like gels and stuff. But again, if you just want to understand the viscous behavior of materials, then rotational tests would suffice. But if you want to understand the viscoelastic behavior, what part of my material is viscous in nature and what part of my material is elastic in nature, then you go for something called as uh, an oscillatory measurement. We'll come to that in a few slides from now. So first thing, when you look at it, then you say, how are you going to do uh, a rotational test or how are you going to figure out viscosity? There's going to be a bit of basics as well, because without basics, I cannot go into the test and how you're actually interpreting the data. So uh, kindly bear with me for a few slides from now. And in here, like in most cases, you need a model, a model which is going to take into account different aspects and then you know you'll simplify it and then say okay for instance here you have two plates two plates and then you're going to move the two plates against each other in principle you're going to have a relative motion but in reality what happens is the bottom plate is going to stay put the upper plate is going to be moved and this is the sample which comprises of infinite number of parallel laminar layers of high touch the area of these plates is fixed the force is what you apply and then when you apply the force, you get a certain amount of displacement. And based on the parameters here, for example, the force that you apply, the area, the height, and the displacement, of course, displacement is used in a different way, that you can get the shear stress tau as the ratio between force and the area, and shear rate as a ratio between the velocity and the height. So velocity is, again, basic physics, rate of change of uh, displacement, and then you have the height, which is constant. So in principle, what you're looking at is the effect of force and the displacement that you're going to get as a result of that. So from those two parameters, you can get the dynamic viscosity, which is shear stress over shear rate. As simple as this. There's no rocket science. This was uh, from Sir Isaac Newton back in the late uh, uh, 17th century. And if you want to understand viscoelastic behavior, like I said, some materials can exhibit or do exhibit viscous and elastic behavior so you can take into account spring model i mean most of us have heard about the hookian behavior like hooks uh, law for instance when you apply a certain amount of load to a spring considerable load of course within a certain limit again then you get an elongation x and then you double the load then you get double the elongation because the elongation is directly proportional to the force that's being applied and the constant of proportionality C is a spring constant. You apply the same thing over two uh, rheology as well, or here, and then you get G is a shear modulus, which is the ratio between the shear stress and the shear strain. Compare it with the previous equation, there you had the shear rate here. Again, the models are different. Again, there it was the two plate model where you sheared one against the other, and here you have uh, a spring model where you have elongation in a certain direction. Again. Both are a bit different, but at the end, what you're looking at is, if you're looking at it, then you're having stress and strain. And then how do you go from there over to something called as viscous behavior and elastic behavior? So what you see here is, again, you're applying a sinusoidal wave in an oscillatory uh, test where you have the stress that you apply and the resulting strain. And here you again have the face lag. So in case you are dealing with a perfectly elastic material, the phase lag is going to be zero or the phase shift angle is going to be zero. But if you have a viscoelastic material, then it's going to be anywhere between zero and 90 degrees. 90 degrees is for purely viscous materials. That will give you the complex modulus, stress amplitude over strain amplitude, which when you plot at an angle delta, which is this over here, then you get the X and Y intercepts as the storage and the loss moduli which are actually going to give you the elastic and viscous behavior of the material. So this is the basis of what we do or what or how you can characterize different materials uh, about their viscosity and viscoelasticity. Now we come to rheometry. So as I mentioned, when you look at it, then primarily what you're seeing is the effect of stress and strain. So you're applying stress and you're looking at strain or vice versa, you're applying or you're getting to a certain strain and then seeing how much stress you have to apply to get there. And 
whatever you apply in between, like in the periphery, you know, not in between, in the periphery, like the temperature, humidity, or magnet or electric field, or some people even bombard them with neutron radiation, that is all in the periphery. You're going to apply them, but at the end, what you're going to look at is the effect of stress and strain, or the effect of one over the other. So how do we do that? So here, simply put, uh, this is how a rheometer looks like. You have the motor here, which has a shaft and this, let's say, and this is going to rotate about its axis, vertical axis. So in order to keep it put at its axis so that it doesn't, uh, you know, dwindle or, you know, like uh, wobble or something, we would use uh, typically a bearing. But the problem with the conventional ball bearing is that it has its own internal friction and that internal friction will add on to the samples friction or samples resistance to flow and would give you the sum of the torque that is applied. But if you have the bearing friction, which is considered or, you know, it's, it's a relatively high, then the problem will be that you will not be able to characterize your sample properly because yeah, that's gonna interfere. So what we did is simply put air cushions in both the axial and radial direction so that you don't have any uh, direct contact between the rotating or moving parts, and that would give you very, very low internal friction, would mean that you can get to minimum torques of 0.5 nanometer meters. If I say like one kilogram, you can assume what one kilogram means, a liter of water, or you can say like one kilogram of sugar that you can have in your hand. But how much is 0.5 nanometer meters? This is this much. Extend your arm, put a grain of sand, and then the force that that grain of sand exists at your shoulder is what is still higher than 0.5 nanometer meter. So this is the sensitivity of the instrument. What else can be measured? You can measure effect of temperature, effect of pressure, as I already mentioned, humidity and a lot of other parameters. You can also do structural uh, measurements, like you can look at microscopy, so what's changing in your sample with uh, with changing temperature, changing shear rate, or changing, uh, you know, you can apply some UV radiation and see what's going on. Or you can even look at spectroscopy, for instance, when you're looking at uh, chemical changes. So Raman spectroscopy is a good example of that. IR spectroscopy is also another example of that. Or you can also do dynamic mechanical thermal analysis, mostly used for polymers, of course, to understand the gas transition temperature. You can look at the stiffness and a lot of other parameters as well. And there's tribology again, which deals with friction and lubrication, which also can be done with a rheometer. And then you have powder rheology, wherein you look at the effect of, uh, like, let's not say effect of, but characteristics of powder. So when you, when you want to look at flow behavior of powder, it's not in liquid form, but in powder form, you can do that as well. And then of course, we'll start as well. Different measuring setups this is a very short example of how you actually do this measurement. This is a typical uh, setup, a plate plate geometry, like you saw this parallel plate or two plate geometry. The bottom plate, the top plate, and then the sample in between. This is an accelerated video, so it's going a little faster than it's supposed to in real life or it is in real life. Because if it goes this fast, then it's going to give some kind of shock to the sample, which is not desired. So you trim away the excess. And yeah, then the point here being, you know the exact area of this particular uh, upper plate, then you know exactly the area of the surface area. And then you know exactly how much height the sample is. And then the force that you apply, you, of course you apply so much force that you know that, and then you can get the displacement or you measure the displacement and the end of it, you get all the parameters that you need to calculate viscosity or viscoelasticity. You have different geometries. Parallel plate, cone plate. To simply put, uh, the choice of geometry depends on basically your sample. What kind of sample you have? If you have a sample with uh, very low viscosity, or you have sample with uh, different particles in it, different particles with different particle size, or so on and so forth. So again, to to know more about those characteristics, you can get in touch with me, or you know, write to us, or call me directly. So anything is uh, okay. So we'll leave, uh, or we can talk about that later. So if standard geometries are not okay, you can also use these, uh, let's say, relative geometries, that's what they're called on the right side that you can see a ball geometry or a stirrer with weights and stuff. And you also have profiles. So if you have slippage in your sample, then you can use this profile geometry. So a lot of things can be done. 
Now we come to the test and data part. So as I said, you can do rotation tests and oscillatory tests. So those are kind of like run of the mill tests that you can do. So in rotation tests, like you can imagine it's a unidirectional rotation, so nothing much gonna happen there. So you rotate at a certain speed or increase the speed or decrease the speed. So one of the way to uh, show the data is a viscosity curve. So you see viscosity as a function of shear rate. Shear rate is again with velocity over height. So height is constant. So you can just imagine this as a function of velocity. So why is this important? You'll see as well. So this shear rate, as your shear rate is increasing, the sample viscosity decreases. So this is classic shear thinning behavior. The other behavior is shear thickening, wherein it goes the other way around, but it's not so common. And ideally viscous materials like mineral oil or water or these things are called Newtonian because shear rate doesn't have an effect on them. So they are not affected by the shear rate per se. And why is that? Because they don't have any micromolecules in them or some structure that can get deformed or so on and so forth. And why does shear thinning happen? So you can imagine if you have some platelets or you have some needle shaped particles or you have some suspensions or agglomerates, they can change their characteristics during the flow. Like when you increase the speed, then perhaps these particles are going to align themselves in the direction of flow, or you know they can break up and offer lower resistance. 